Kia ora. My name is Aloise Wallace. I'm Director of Tairawhiti Museum and Deputy Chair of Historic Places Tairawhiti. I'm standing here today in one of the treasures of Gisborne, a unique remnant of our maritime history and an iconic part of our cityscape, the Star of Canada. She was once a ship, she became a house and she's now a museum. It was 109 years ago, on the 23rd of June, that the Star of Canada was wrecked off the rocks of Kaiti Beach. The Star of Canada was a twin screw cargo steamer built in Belfast in 1909 by Workman Clark & Co. The ship was 7,280 tonnes gross, 143 metres long and manned by a crew of 60. Workman Clark & Co pioneered the construction of insulated and refrigerated vessels and the Star of Canada was designed to carry chilled and frozen meat. It had three insulated holds with a carrying capacity of 130,000 carcasses of mutton. When the ship joined the Star Line, it was the first twin-screwed ship to enter the company in the pride of the line. By 1912, the Star had made the journey to and from New Zealand six times, transporting general cargo to Australia and New Zealand, and returning with refrigerated meat and produce. I'm here in the captain's cabin of the Star of Canada. On the Star of Canada's last voyage, her captain was John Manhart. Captain Hart was born in Liverpool and went to sea at the age of 14. By the time he was captaining the Star, he'd been at sea for 30 years and in and out of Gisborne for 10. The captain's cabin and all the fixtures and fittings you see in here are largely original and as they would have looked in 1912. On what was to be her final voyage, the Star of Canada left London, first heading to Australia. She stopped in Melbourne and then in Sydney, unloading general cargo and picking up antimonial lead pigs, a motor car and silver lead bullion. From there, she came to New Zealand, first stopping in Auckland and then travelling around the country, uh, calling in at Bluff, Littleton, Wellington, Napier and finally arriving in Gisborne on the 21st of June. The Star of Canada was loaded all that day and the next and by evening, when loading ceased for the weekend, she was anchored securely out in the roadstead. Standing here where the Star of Canada is today looking out over the calm waters of the Taruheru River, we have to use our imagination to imagine that evening when the ship was wrecked. On the evening of the 23rd, a sudden storm came in from the southwest. At 10 p.m., with squalls increasing, preparations were made to head out to sea, but steam could not at once be put up. When the rain cleared away 10 minutes later, they realised the anchor had come away and begun to drag. They made preparations to lower the port anchor, but before they could, the ship struck the rocks. Distress rockets were let off in the hope of attracting attention from the harbour authorities or any other would-be rescuers. Many residents of the town were aroused by the booming of her distress signals, but it was not until H. Amos of the Post and Telegraph Department, who went around and read her Morse code messages, that it became known that she was aground. At 1.30am, a rescue attempt was made by the tug Karoro. However, she turned back at the river's entrance because of the severe conditions. Another, much smaller tug, the Hippie, did make it out to where the Star of Canada lay, but was only able to relay communication. The morning of the 25th dawned fine and clear, with a light westerly and smooth sea, and revealed the Star of Canada was well down by the head. People flocked down to the beach to witness the spectacle. The film clips we are watching are from a film produced by the Dominion New Zealand Film Company. The cameraman was Charles Frederick Newham. The next couple of days centred around salvaging as much of the cargo as possible with the help of the Hippie, Karoro and Tuatia. The cargo included 35,000 carcasses of mutton, 10,000 sacks of oats, 1,000 casks of tallow and pelts, 300 bales of wool and 300 tonnes of antimony, which had to be recovered from holds filled with water. An attempt was made to pump out the holds which held the valuable frozen produce, but the water rose so fast that the pumps made no impression. I'm holding here a piece of antimony in the museum's collection. Antimony is a metalloid which has a variety of uses and was one of the items of cargo on the Star of Canada. This piece was collected by Captain Thomas Franks who helped with the salvage on the ship. It was probably loaded onto the Star at Bluff. On Wednesday 26, the salvage steamer Terafiti arrived from Wellington and made strenuous efforts to refloat the ship, but was unable to release her from the reef. On the 27th, salvage operations continued night and day, but the ship worked lower into the Papa Rock, and a heavy swell eventually broke the Star of Canada's back. All hopes of saving the vessel ended and she was abandoned to the underwriters on the 8th of July. Salvage operations were eventually suspended on August 5, 1912, and the ship was put up for sale. 
In the investigation which followed, the court considered all the evidence and concluded the accident was the result of pure accident and misadventure, which could not have been foreseen by the master of the vessel. Captain Hart was described as a most careful, prudent and cautious shipmaster. The court concluded that no blame was attachable to Captain Hart or any person and that they will leave the court without the slightest stain on their professional reputations. The crew of the Happy went out to try and help the ship in very dangerous conditions and seven of the crew were later given medals in recognition of their courage. We have two of these medals in the museum collection, one given to Ernest Warren and another one given to T. Ogden. On the back they say, in commemoration of gallant attempt by crew of SS Hippie to succour the Star of Canada when stranded at Gisborne, New Zealand, 23rd of June 1912. As for the crew of the Star, they were paid off in Gisborne. Some made their way home and others stayed in New Zealand. One, a 34-year-old Latvian seaman, Barrett Krumer, who became known as Russian Jack, took to the road. He was considered to be the last of the old-time swag men, and until 1965 he was a well-known character, particularly in Hawke's Bay and the Wairarapa. Russian Jack is remembered with affection, and there is a statue commemorating him in Masterton. But, unlike most shipwrecks, the story does not end there for the Star of Canada. A local engineer, Mr A.C. Mitchell, was in charge of the dismantling of the vessel and the salvaging of the machinery after the Star was handed over to the underwriters. As a result of a wager, he was successful in having the ship's two-storied wheelhouse and captain's cabin, plus part of the deck superstructure, brought ashore. Mr William Good, a local jeweller, brought the bridge house for £104 and had it towed through town on greased railway lines behind a steam roller to an empty section next to his own home at 274 Childers Road. This would be its resting place for 73 years. In this location, the cabin and bridge house became a tourist attraction, Something to delight the landlubber and bring back memories to old salts who no longer sail the seas, as a newspaper article from the house's heyday put it. The open sections on the deck on both levels were filled in, first with canvas blinds and later with lead like glass. When William's daughter Lorna married in 1927, rooms were added to the rear of the structure to provide a kitchen, bathroom and other facilities. The cabin where I'm standing now was kept intact and it was used as a sitting room. The wheelhouse was used as a bedroom and the front deck as a sunroom. The gates to the property itself had another nautical connection. They were made from the sliced up wheel of the Monowai, which was scuttled to form a breakwater at Gisborne in 1926. Lorna Woodfield spent her later years living in the family home next door, keeping the Star of Canada as an immaculate private museum. There have been many visitors to the Star of Canada over the years. Here at the museum we have a visitor's book from 1929 through to the early 1950s. Everyone has put their signature in the book. And the first entry in the book is then Prime Minister Sir Joseph Ward, who visited on the 4th of March 1929. On her death in 1983, Lorna left the Star to the citizens of Gisborne, provided a suitable use and site could be found for it. As the execution of the will dragged on, people became concerned that the house was heading for ruin. In 1985, it was moved from Childers Road to its present site with the Gisborne West Rotary Club leading the charge. The move became a kind of public festival and parade, the Gisborne Herald reported. The ceremony will start at 1pm to coincide with the high tide, when officers and a compliment from HMNZS Hawia coming here especially for the event will assemble at Reeds Quay. They will be met by the Gisborne Civic Band who will join them in a march to the Star site in Calvin Park. As they cross the Peel Street Bridge, a group of Gisborne Sea Scouts will row their cutters up the river to meet up with them on the Calvin Park River Bank. With a bit of luck, there will be enough onshore wind to enable junior members of the Gisborne Yacht Club to sail in alongside. The ship's voyage was marked in traditional style as Mona Brown, wife of Alan Brown, a ringleader of the project, launched the ship with a bottle of champagne and since then it has been a much-loved treasure for visitors of all ages to Tairawhiti Museum. Not only do we have the building, but we have so many artefacts that help to tell her story. All the people that sailed in her, that salvaged the ship, that cared for and restored her. So many visitors have come through her doors and marvelled at her. And it's thanks to the efforts of all of those people in our community that we can stand in the ship here today.